Sup, you beautiful bastards. It's like a billion degrees outside, but I'm still wearing a hoodie because I hate my body that much. Welcome back to the Philip DeFranco Show. It is Tuesday, June 29th, 2021. Hit that like button and let's just jump into it. And the first thing that we're gonna talk about today involves a sentence I, I have very rarely been given the privilege of saying without sarcasm, and that is Donald Trump was right about at least this one thing and not all the other stuff because he's a crazy person. But yeah, even all the way back in 2017, Donald Trump famously said, and granted the first part of the sentence is wrong, another reason that we're going to win another four years, okay, you were wrong on that part, is because newspapers, television, all forms of media will tank if I'm not there because without me, the ratings are going down the tubes. And that last part, as it turns out, incredibly right. But even as I said back in 2020, I welcome that. It's anecdotal, but most of the people I know that voted for Joe Biden just wanted off of the crazy train. What's really interesting about this data from Comscore is that while almost everyone has been hit pretty hard, the outlets hit the hardest have been the most extreme. Far left, monthly traffic dropping 27.3%. Far right, monthly traffic 43.8%. Right there, you're comparing places like Mother Jones and Newsmax. Then as we come in from the more extremes, but still, Partisan, we see left-leaning traffic dropping 16.7%, right-leaning traffic 26.9%, right? You're comparing boxes to Fox Newses. Also, as far as engagement on social media, we're seeing massive drops there as well. Axios reporting the data from Sensor Tower showing the downloads of fringe right social networking apps like MeWe, Rumble, Parler, and CloudHub have plummeted. With data from NewsWhip showing left-leaning and right-leaning publishers have seen social interactions on stories drop by more than 50%, while mainstream publishers have experienced a slightly more modest drop of 42%. But also, once again, none of this should really be surprising. I mean, think about it. A big part of the reason, especially last year, that the ratings were so huge, one, we were all locked inside and we took to the internet and news and that like became many people's world. But also because two, it felt like every time you looked to the internet, you were like, am I, are we gonna die? Is the country about to explode? I mean, it's the same reason that people watch live police chases or like the guy that goes over the Grand Canyon on a little tightrope. You're like, is he gonna fall to his death? And actually, I mean, oddly enough, but also of course he did, Donald Trump actually, while I was filming this video, released a statement regarding the drop in ratings saying, they say the news is boring since I left DC. A wonderful thing to see. Yes, Donnie, it is. It turns out people are far less interested in the news when they weren't forced into that car in the police chase or forced onto that tightrope. And I'll say again what I said before the election, I welcome the calm. I don't care if it hurts my views. I don't care if it hurts my dollars. Hell, I'm even thinking about cutting back on shows just temporarily for this summer, doing some more fun projects and fully embrace my fat daddy summer. Because people, and especially as we get closer to the 2022 midterms, like people are gonna care about the news. It's gonna heat up again, but I think we all need a breather, man. That's kind of why I jokingly ended the last few shows going like, I've taken enough of your time, get off the internet, I love your face. I wanna be your quick daily dose of poison and then you get back to living because we haven't really gotten a good chance to do so in the last 15 months. But also with this story, it's the question I'm most interested in today. The question I wanna pass off to you right now have you noticed a change in your viewing habits? And obviously this might be skewed a little bit because you're watching the show right now, but a uh, change in habits with whether it be my show, other shows, what about social media as well? Or no, is it the same for you? And, and whatever your answer is, why do you think that is? I mean, hell, I report the news and even I'm trying to pull back. But yeah, with that said, let me give you some poison so you can get back to your day. Yesterday we saw the e-cigarette company Juul agreeing to pay $40 million to North Carolina. With this agreement being made, it settle allegations that its marketing efforts targeted teens. Which actually notably as a part of this deal, they're going to abandon any marketing content that appeals to young people and in stores, its products will be restricted to behind the counter. And for the company, this is not where the story ends, right? Notably, Juul is currently facing over 700 50 lawsuits across just the United States. And while, you know, a, kind of a big theme whenever we talk about these fines and settlements is, you know, how much is this actually hurt business? Juul has been hurt by all this litigation. I mean, this is a company that back in 2018, when Marlboro bought 35% of them, was valued at $38 billion. But as recently as October of 2020, they were worth only about 10 billion, which still, Huge. But generally speaking, going down is something that you want your partner to do, not companies that you have a stake in. Then, in your interesting random fact of the day today, there are currently 56.1 million millionaires in the world, which is kind of an absolutely huge number, but also relatively small, right? It's like uh, seven tenths of a percent of the population of Earth. And actually, as it turns out, where the millionaires are, it's pretty consolidated with just over 50% of the millionaires coming from China, Japan, and the United States with actually the United States taking gold. This is America, I can't just make it a list. We won so far until China eventually passes us with 39.1% of the millionaires in the United States, 9.4% in China, 6.5% in Japan. Though per capita, the United States is not number one. Thus, it is not an official category, no awards, will be given, but 
on this unsanctioned podium. You had Switzerland at the top, 14.9%, 9.4% of Australians, and 8.8% of Americans. Then we had fake Instagram people in the news, and I don't mean plastic in bodies or personalities, but rather followers. Though, to be fair, several people on the list probably do check all of those boxes, starting with Kylie and Kendall Jenner. At the time, Fast Host did their analysis. Kylie Jenner had 223.5 million followers, and the service said that 40% of those are fake, followed by Kendall Jenner, who is at 37%. Then you actually have Blake Lively and Justin Bieber, also at 37%. Then you've got Rihanna, Zayn Malik, blah, 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 blah. It's also not just mainstream people, right? Addison Rae on the list, 32% fake reportedly. Though, notably, to be fair, just because they are fake doesn't necessarily mean that they were paid for, right? There, there might not be an intent there. They could just be bots. And notably with this story, we've seen people taking this list, right? Fake followers, then combining that and comparing that to Hopper HQ, uh, an Instagram analytics service putting out an annual Instagram rich list. Right, with the mindset here being, oh my God, look at these companies are actually getting ripped off because these people have fake followers. Right, some pointing to Ariana Grande, for example, third highest paid star, making a little over 1.5 million per post, allegedly. But also at the same time, she is 25th on the fast host list with 27% of her followers reportedly being fake. Right, a lot of the same names as far as fake followers, you know, they, they top the list as far as money. And so the mindset is, oh, you may have followers that are fake, but the money is very, very real. And also, my counter to that as someone who has been in this space for 15 years, if you are a marketer and you are paying someone based off of the number of followers they have, you are bad at your job. You're just giving away money and you should be fired. Like the number of times I've found out that someone with a smaller follower account, but with uh, more engagement, more views on individual pieces of content that they release gets paid less, then me, it's like, it's mind boggling. Hell, I mean, it's part of the reason why I don't really talk about this publicly. I launched a boutique management and ad agency, which, hey, self-promotion time. If you're a brand that's been having a hard time, brands at wearetribal.com. If you're a creator that you're not happy with uh, merch, ad, anything at all, management, blah, blah, blah. Reach out, creators at wearetribal.com. We don't accept a ton of people. It, like I said, it's a boutique. And uh, I think once you get to a crazy scale, you, you stop being able to do good by people, but yeah. But from that, let's take a second to pay some bills and thank the fantastic sponsor of today's show, Square. Space. You know, over the past year, I know many of you have found your passion projects and what truly makes you happy. Whether it means finally getting your independent business off the ground or creating a place to share your homemade goods, new favorite hobby, obsession, or maybe even just having a personal blog to get all the thoughts out of your head. And Squarespace is there to help. And with Squarespace, it is so easy. There is nothing to install, patch, or upgrade ever. And creating a beautiful website with Squarespace's all-in-one platform has never been so simple. It's extremely intuitive and easy to use. Plus, with Squarespace, you get access to all their marketing tools and analytics and personalized support from their award-winning customer care team via email or live chat. Whatever you you need, they're available 24 seven to help out. So if you want to check it out, see if it's right for you, see why so many others before you have loved it, go ahead and start your free trial today over at squarespace.com slash Phil. And when you realize you love it, make sure you enter an offer code Phil to get 10% off your first purchase. Then in very big NCAA news, we saw their powerful division one council recommending that the organization allow college athletes to finally make money from their autographs, appearances, endorsements, and social media, which is an absolutely massive move. It takes these student athletes and some people are going to call this hyperbole, but it's how I see it. Well, effectively four years helped make billions of dollars for giant organizations, essentially as indentured servants. They get some uh, food, they get a place to sleep, they get an education, which is already incredibly overpriced. But with this potential massive move, we could see players, I mean, at the very least making a living and some players making millions of dollars. Also, I do want to say with this story before you're like, yeah, NCAA, good on you. Remember that uh, the NCAA is very much right now like a, a dog that's had its face shoved in its own shit. Though I don't really like that metaphor because it makes me kind of sympathetic towards the NCAA. It's, uh, no, I guess it's more like your douchebag boss got punched in the dick because he was a douchebag and then he was like, maybe I'll be less of a douchebag. I mean, the organization has faced growing and growing pressure to end its rules, which they, they say are aimed at protecting amateurism. But I mean, anyone really paying attention knows that's bullshit, right? It's about power and money. And I mean, if you look at the timeline, this move comes just days before a key death deadline on July 1st when eight of the 21 states that have passed laws enabling athletes the name, image, and likeness option will have those laws go into effect. So in order to prevent athletes from playing with different sets of rules depending on what state their college is in, the Division I Council is seeking to suspend the rule to even the playing field. Though a big thing here, the NCAA has said committees in D2 and 3 are expected to vote on the subject by tomorrow, which is also when the D1 Board of Directors is expected to officially approve their policy as well. And as far as what happens next, if the recommendations are then approved, the student athletes in those states can now make money from activities activities that are consistent with the laws, and athletes in states that don't have those laws can also engage in those activities, but 
individual schools there will be given the power to adopt their own policies. And as far as Division One, it is anticipated that the new policy would actually go into effect on Thursday, but also leaders in the NCAA have painted this latest change as a temporary fix until Congress passes some federal law for a national standard. But also notably, Congress so far has failed to intervene. Then in news that helps explain other news, maybe yesterday you saw the headline, Facebook is a trillion dollar company. Yes, part of the reason for that is big company, big money, hoo-ha. And yesterday we saw a massive setback at attempts to crack down on big tech in general and Facebook specifically. With a federal judge throwing out two antitrust lawsuits against Facebook that have been brought by the Federal Trade Commission and 48 state attorneys general. Right, and as far as the specifics, uh, the lawsuits focus on the platform's 2012 and 2014 acquisitions of Instagram and WhatsApp. If they had been successful, they would have forced Facebook to divest from the apps, but uh, really they got the exact opposite result that they were looking for. And that's because with the FTC case, I mean, we saw the judge absolutely shredding the agency's argument, saying it did not provide enough facts to back up its claims that Facebook holds a monopoly in social networking. And while, yeah, he did give the FTC a chance to refile the challenge in 30 days, he suggested that it is likely to face an uphill battle. And while that may sound like, okay, well, the other case, it couldn't have gone worse, it did, with a judge completely dismissing the state case, arguing that the lengthy delay between the acquisitions and the suit's 2020 filing was unprecedented on a state level. And this was fantastic news for Facebook. The shares for the company went up, hitting historic market cap. But also, this is unlikely to be the end of the story. I mean, we've already seen congressional lawmakers saying that the judge's decision showcases that old antitrust laws need to be updated for the age of the internet. And in fact, I mean, it's now being reported that the White House is working on a potential executive order that would strengthen antitrust enforcement. With that order reportedly calling on the Justice Department and the FTC, to update guidance on how they examine proposed mergers. But that would also require government to actually work properly, and so who knows? <laughs> then we should definitely talk about this news around Britney Spears, her family, and the kind of whole free Britney reckoning that we saw kick into high gear last week. If you didn't see my coverage of it on Thursday, I mean, we even brought a lawyer in to talk about the details on it. I highly recommend it. Right, and among the things that we went in depth on, I mean, uh, we talked about Britney Spears saying that the conservatorship that she is in is abusive, that she was forced to work, not allowed to marry, or have children thanks to a forced IUD and uh, that it was just incredibly restricting and that she wants her life back. We saw an immediate wave of support, some of that even continuing this week, Christina Aguilera taking to Twitter, saying to be silenced, ignored, bullied, or denied support by those close to you is the most depleting, devastating, and demeaning thing imaginable. The harmful mental and emotional damage this can take on a human spirit is nothing to be taken lightly. And for a lot of people, it was that in quotes close that really stood out. Right there, many people thinking of Britney Spears' father, Jamie, but also a number of people thinking about Jamie Lynn Spears, her sister. The number of people wondering things like, where the hell has she been? Why is she being so quiet on this matter with everything blowing up? Especially because Jamie Lynn has faced criticism in the past for not speaking out about her sister's situation more. People think that she might be involved in some way. But among other things in the past, we've seen her post things saying that she's always been there for Britney, that people are often commenting on things that they don't understand, saying that when it comes to mental illness, people need to respect people's privacy. Also, after the Framing Britney Spears documentary came out, she shared an Instagram story asking the media not to repeat its mistakes, that people are always fighting a secret battle. And while some thought that this was to defend her sister, others thought that her statements were not enough and that they kind of equated to nothing. And some even think that she stood to gain financially from the conservatorship and was profiting off of her sister's abuse. But Jamie Lynn actually responded in an Instagram Instagram story yesterday denying that she was financially profiting off of the situation and saying that she just wants her sister to be happy. I don't care if she wants to run away to rainforest and have a zillion babies in the middle of nowhere or if she wants to come back and dominate the world the way she has so many times before. Because I have nothing to gain or lose either way. This situation does not affect me either way because I am only her sister who is only concerned about her happiness. I assure you that I've supported my sister long before there was a hashtag and I'll support her long after. Note that. I'm so proud of her for using her voice. I am so proud of her for requesting new counsel, like I told her to do many years ago. Oh, not on a big public platform, but just in a personal conversation between two sisters. With Jamie Lynn closing by saying that if ending the conservatorship is what makes Britney happy, that's what she wants for her sister. And while there were definitely some that were like, okay, good, Jamie Lynn spoke up, uh, it did not go over well with a lot of people. Many seeing this as Jamie Lynn just kind of defending herself from accusations instead of actually trying to be an advocate for her sister. But essentially, many people seeing Britney Spears as someone that was kind of locked in this tiny box, and her sister was someone that could have spoken out more freely. Right? Especially because a big part of the reason why I think a lot of people feel like there's actually movement now is because of the, the leaked audio and the leaked transcripts of Britney's own words. Right? It was finally this confirmation for the masses that this tiny group, the, the Free Britney movement, has been shouting for years. But yeah, with this story, I would love to know your thoughts on this, uh, whether it be around the whole situation or 
uh, Jamie Lynn Spears specifically. Then, I don't know if you've been outside at all, but the earth is trying to kill a bunch of us right now, like a, a body running a fever trying to kill off a virus. Right, and more specifically, I mean, the Pacific Northwest right now being hit by a historical heat wave with more than a dozen cities in Oregon and Washington smashing records in a region that it's not really accustomed to temperatures well above 100 degrees. I mean, for example, in Portland, the city hit a record high of 108 degrees on Saturday, which would have been crazy, except for the fact that they then broke that record on Sunday with 112 degrees, and then on Monday, it was 116 degrees. As well as, I mean, Seattle, Seattle doesn't even know what's happening right now. Monday there, it was 108 degrees, which was crazy in its own right, but it also marked the first time in recorded history for that city to have three consecutive days over 100 degrees. Also, in another part of Washington, it was 118 degrees is a preliminary state record. I know there are gonna be some people, there always are people from Arizona that are like, hey, well in Arizona, no one should live in Arizona. Been there, proposed to my wife there, amazing people. It is not fit for human life. And understand, I am well aware that in the last decade living in Southern California, it has made me soft to weather, right? We have like a variation of one season year round. But even with that said, understand the heat in these cities are real. I mean, the highs at this time of year are normally in the 70s, but across the region, we're seeing things like roads literally buckling, power cables melting. Also, I mean, a real concern here, especially when you're talking about places like Portland and Seattle, in those cities, a lot of people don't have proper cooling systems in their homes and apartments. Seattle is, I didn't even realize they had this data, they rank as the least air conditioned city compared to the top 15 metro areas. Right? While around 91% of US homes have primary air conditioning, in Portland, only 78% do, and in Seattle, only 44% do. Which is also why it's not a surprise that as a result, both cities have seen a large spike in heat related illnesses. With all this, as far as why we're seeing these incredibly rare and historic temperatures, there are two explanations. The first is a highly unusual weather pattern known as a heat dome, which is, I mean, exactly what it sounds like, right? A ridge of high pressure that functions like a lid or a dome on the atmosphere, trapping in hot air that tries to escape and warming even more as it sinks. But also here's the thing with this specific situation. Scientists have said that a heat dome of this size and scope is so rare that it is normally only expected to happen once every several thousand years. However, the key word there is normally, because the second reason that experts are saying we're seeing these incredibly high temperatures, I mean, this is gonna blow your mind. It's a new concept, climate change. And more specifically, studies have shown that human-caused climate change has made these heat domes stronger, more intense, and longer lasting. And it's important to note that it's not just these domes. Widespread scientific evidence shows that heat waves have become more frequent, lengthy, and serious in recent years as part of an overall warming trend. Right, worldwide, the seven warmest years in the history of accurate record keeping have been in the last seven years, and 19 of the 20 warmest years globally have taken place since 2000. Right, I mean, this is a bigger issue. I know that I focus heavily on the Pacific Northwest and the United States, but I mean, brothers and sisters in Canada are having a huge problem. Also, back in the United States, uh, the Northeast and in New England, you have about 34 million people under heat advisories, as were parts of Idaho, California and Nevada. So yeah, I guess the main thing, just be safe out there right now. I mean, the, the good news for the short term, especially for people in the Pacific Northwest, is that yesterday did appear to be the peak of the heat dome. But the bad news is it, it doesn't feel like this is going to be the end of it. This is just part of the trend. Climate change is real and we feel it more and more every day, every month, every year. But ultimately, with this story or honestly anything else that stood out to you today, I'd love to know your thoughts in those comments down below because one, this is supposed to be a conversation and two, this is the end of today's show. As always, thank you for watching, like and subscribe and all the good stuff. If you're looking to catch up on some news, I got you covered right here with some more of it. But with that said, of course, as always, my name's Philip DeFranco. You've just been filled in. I love yo faces and I'll see you tomorrow. Unless I, uh, I get jury duty. I, uh, we'll see.